I am also told that there were witnesses to this, which is a saucer-like craft that became disabled on the ranch back in the trees and landed there and another craft came over to it, extended a docking mechanism of some sort, attached itself to the disabled craft, picked it up and then they both flew away. Welcome back. I'm here again with Dr. David Morehouse, and we're going to continue our discussion on the background related to his appearance on Beyond Skinwalker Ranch, Episode 3, Rocky Mountain Ranch, which when I say appearance, it was in the additional material section. But today we're going to focus on some of the high strangeness that we saw focused specifically on UAP contacts and things like that. So, David, welcome back. Thanks, folks. Sorry, I'm pouring myself some organe plant protein here. So, Sean doesn't let me eat or drink anything when I'm doing these things. So, You get some allowances from time to time. <laughs> if you behave yourself, which <laughs> is rare. Very rare yeah. that I do. I like behave myself. Okay, here we are. Okay, so if you've been following us along in this series, we've already briefed the map sensing and the verbal and visual data that went along with the map sensing, both horizontal and vertical. So you saw the clustering of the sensed data points, and you also saw the presentation of like a 3D model showing those data points, how they looked going up. 14,000 feet above ground level and 10,000 feet below ground level. So it was a different way to package that data. So you got to see that. Right now, we're going to brief the target summary data that came back from the 70 remote viewers that dealt with the pastime target, which they did as either coordinate remote viewers or extended remote viewers. And this is just a fractional harvesting of the data that came out. And the requirement for this was just trying to get out of the thousands of th pieces of data, harvesting just enough that could fit like within, you know, maybe 10 minutes of on-screen time. So much of it was just left. And you just have to understand that, that what you're looking at here is just fractional. And it's going to always be that way unless it's going to be just a show about remote viewing. And then here we are with Sean doing this, and it's already, this will be probably three parts. <laughs> but tell me it edits it down. So it's just high volumes of data, but it's fun to see what viewers are able to do. So here again, this had an event arc of time that I, I showed you. This goes from 2100 on the 3rd of April. 1976, all the way to 03 on the 4th of April, 1976. Okay. So I broke this up into several different areas, categories of data. This was boxes underground, metal boxes, transparent boxes, glass boxes, because that seemed to be part of the high strangeness of this place. There were mm -hmm. boxes that were emitting high energies with life forms in them, and as the story went, after we got the feedback from Katie and the crew about what the viewers were perceiving here is this was something that actually was part of the encounter of this place and that these boxes often stopped people right in their tracks and they couldn't move forward or backward and they couldn't think and they couldn't communicate. But you'll see some examples of that you know, here. So first categories of data are just showing these from different viewers. Now, again, different viewers sketch in different ways. So we're always just looking for correlations of data, commonality, trending, that kind of stuff. So, you know, this is a transparent, wavering green source of light, hot, solid to the touch, but difficult to see moving and pulsing. And this is in it like some sort of energy field or something moving and pulsing inside this box. In this one, it's describing a man kneeling next to it, but the viewer later described it as it's not kneeling next to it, it's in it. This viewer is a little more advanced in terms of they got some dimensionality to it, it's meaning 
because remember they're detecting eight dimensional waveform expression of data, decoding it into four dimensional lexicon and imagery. And then they're having to objectify that in two dimensions on a piece of paper. So it's neat when you see some viewers actually capture because they make it a point of, you know, what's the width, the depth or the height of something. And this gives you those dimensions and feet that this particular viewer was able to get. And then this person with like a clipboard or something observing this thing and looking in it, or this is looking in it, or this is in it as it was later described. But the idea here is the commonality of this is that there's boxes with some sort of energy in them. Here's another viewer doing different portrayal, two different viewers. You know, here's one where this box has like this energy vortex going up out of it. And there's a life form like the one in the other slides, but there's a life form now hovering above it. And the box glows and it hums and it vibrates. And then you look to the right of the slide and now you see another rectangular box with a strong ELF emitting from inside of it. And there's an intelligent life form inside, organic green light and energy radiating from it. Here is uh, a viewer's depiction of being frozen and being paralyzed by some invisible force. Can't move from the waist down, can't think, can't focus my eyes. There's a force emanating from a square object laying in front of me. Now, I, when I showed this, you know, there was a camera on Katie the whole time because they actually thought that she might cry because this would have all brought back very frightening memories and experiences for her. She didn't cry. In fact, didn't show a lot of emotion about it, except it was really clear in the close-ups of her face as this was unfolding that it was bringing back scary things in her mind. But she was also keen to go, that's exactly what happened that night. It's exactly what people described that were out at this party with her stepfather and her mother and all of their friends that were out there, what they experienced. And so this is a viewer's description of that. The viewer said, it feels like I'm in mud waist high. That's just the viewer interpreting that data. Nobody mm -hmm. was in mud waist high, but this is how viewers interpret things, right? That's why it's never 100% accurate because it's always subject to human interpretation. The viewer senses that there are people frozen and there's a box in front of them, which is precisely what the people who were there claim happened, but the viewer's depiction of it is frozen in mud. There's another viewer over here describing it as like a hum, like vibration. It makes me stand still and I'm unmovable. Here's the glass box with some sort of a blue flame inside, radiating, omnidirectional, perceived, but not physically visible. So these are three different viewers sketching humans, you know, in this place. And this was one of the things that the key person uh, about this story, Katie, was like, how can they do that? This is what happened. How can they do this? How can they see this stuff happening? Well, that's a long explanation, but they can. And in one of the sketches, it's like, what is this? Why am I here? I've driven here, recalcitrant, right? Those are the things that came out of people's mouths, according to her. Another, you know, a brain scan, like a pacifying device using an individual hologram or spire-like tool. Now, again, that may have been present. It may have been there. It could also be the viewer just interpreting some aspect of that. You don't know. But the point is that multiple viewers are describing this idea that these boxes are radiating, that these boxes are around, there are life forms in and around these boxes and that they cause a kind of a detrimental effect on human beings when at least the experience out there person dazed confused shocked by something seems like they're on a roadway at night you know who what where how don't get too close kind of so in other words they're sensing the angst and the fear and the confusion in the people that were there during this event arc of time in 1976. there's a male in shock an average build guy 40 years old wondering what you know, or caution, it could approach, you know, what could approach? Well, the question was asked by some of the, the show hosts, asked Katie, I believe, on camera, does that describe one of the men that was there, you know, 30, 40 years old, mm -hmm. and etc. And she said, yeah, but 
there were lots of adults there, you know, and there were lots of them within that age group. I think probably given the time frame, the haircuts were not that short, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. It's just that the verbiage used by different viewers describing, you know, these sketches of human forms that what they were experienced, that was what validated and, and correlated with everything that Katie had experienced there on that one night. I told you you would see these shapes again. Now, every viewer is either better at sketching or not so good at sketching. In the remote viewing unit, the best sketch was actually Mel Riley. Mel Riley was unbelievable, but he was also a photo image interpreter and an artist, but he was a very detailed, you know, realist as an artist, and he did amazing stuff. But here, I like to include these because they're all different viewers and they're all the same thing, which is this craft in flight, which is a wedge shape. But look at how differently they are sketched. You know, one's just a simple contour sketch. One is a contour sketch, but it doesn't actually close or come together, really. These are probe marks, these little dots you see here. And some of these things are right here are the same thing, or it's where the viewer actually described it. And I just had to crop the image down and then record what was written next to it so you could actually read it. Here's another one. It's in flight and it's moving. And you can see the waveforms of the movement and like maybe some propulsion, or maybe this is the track it's following. This one gets huh. three dimension, you know, and again, 15 to 25 foot metallic craft. Looks like stainless steel in flight, super fast. Then, you know, other crazy things can come up. I wanted to put this in here because nobody else came up with this, but I just wanted to show why we never consider this to be 100% accurate. And at the same time, it's data that shouldn't be discounted, all right? It's got to be there, but it's showing some sort of a life form. Now, what does this remind you of? It's like out of Prometheus, right? Mm -hmm. Out of Alien, Prometheus, that kind of stuff, like how those crafts are. When I saw this, that's kind of what came to mind. So why would that show up for a viewer? It's very simple. Viewers are in the process. The protocol requires you to detect, decode, and objectify. Detecting waveform expressions of something is not difficult for us to do once we understand what we're doing. The decoding process is a very human element. And if you have no reference for what it is you are detecting, and as you're in the decoding process of it, your brain moves faster than the universal constant of the speed of light, according to Rauscher and Targ and others who measure the cognition speeds of, of humans. We cognate very fast, which so in the detect and in the decoding process, again, if you have no reference, you cognate very quickly and your brain pulls up a close reference. So it pulls up the closest reference that it thinks that has. So in this particular case, sort of a bad drawing of something that came out of the spaceship control capability uh, on the spaceship in Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're sensing an alien life form or, you know, they're sensing something else. And so their brain pulls up a parallel concept because that's their only reference. I don't know this particular viewer intimately in terms of, you know, how they think or what they are. Some viewers are big sci-fi fans and other viewers don't ever touch the stuff. I mean, they have no interest in it whatsoever. So if you're in the blind as these viewers are, and you have no idea what you're looking at, and you're not a big sci-fi fan, so you don't have a big Rolodex of this stuff, then your brain pulls up what it thinks fits based on the sensory data that it has. And that's why you know, something like this would come. So it's a spongy craft moving up with a life form driving it, but appeared to be sitting on top, moving up and away. Okay. The one on the right, you'll see similar images like this. You probably remember similar images to this as mm -hmm. I was showing you, you know, like the cistern and the top of the cistern and other things. But now these are being described differently, right? These are not being described as a cap on top of something. These are being described as an energetic pulsing craft or a metallic craft that's moving. It's large. Here again, these are other depictions by viewers. And the things that caught, are, allow you to pull it together are the fact that they're being described as orbs or craft and that they're moving away from me, following. Uh, this is, I love this, but following 
a glowing line like a ley line or an invisible sky trail. I had never heard anybody use that descriptor, an invisible sky trail. But now looking at Chaco Canyon and also just looking at what goes on in the western portions of the U.S. and the southwestern portions, mm -hmm. the, you know, Navajo and Apache and all of them, uh, part of the Pueblo Nation, but all of them, the Anasazi, all talk about these kinds of things, these converging points, which if it was Celtic, they would call it a ley line. But these things, these invisible sky trails, that spoke so perfectly to me because having seen the portals and things that I've seen, you know, opening and closing and craft and orbs and lights and things in and around New Mexico, Chaco Canyon, all of those kinds of things, sky trails, invisible sky trails to me, that made perfect sense. And I think because of just the variety of things that are seen and experienced here in, in this particular target area, in that whole area in general, because of the variety and complexity and differences in so many of the things that are perceived here, I think it's really a convergent point. I think it, it's a place where maybe many of these sky trails come together which would follow along with much of the indigenous people's lore of this particular area, that there were portals and there were portals that opened and crossed, you know, openings to other dimensions where, you know, craft come in, craft go out, some maybe one way, some not one way, but different. If this is like a grand central station, right? If it, that's what it is, which I suspect that it is, you're going to see big varieties of life forms and vehicles and different you know, times when it's open and different times when it's active and different times when it's not, both daytime and nighttime. It could be underground part of it. It could be above ground. It, it, you know, it could be separating above and below ground and then opens and combines the two. I mean, there are so many different possibilities, but this starts to explain why you get so much of this anomalous activity out there. And these are things that viewers are pulling together, you know, this outer layer of something like a gaseous layer, gaseous layer, you know, here's another one down, another completely different viewer, soft light, yellow illuminated orb above me, adult with children or young adults looking up and pointing at the object. And so sensing a number of people in a small group, three to five, pointing at the sky, both excited and, and fearful. And then the viewer writes down your fingers pointing. Hmm. Yeah, fingers are pointing. The question was imposed to Katie, did that happen? And she goes, well, yeah, I mean, people around that area have been pointing at stuff in the sky for, you know, forever. So, but it's interesting that during this event arc of time, you know, people, they were experiencing a bunch of different stuff just in that six hour time window. So right. alien life forms, orbs flying around, boxes illuminating and pulsating and being, you know, detrimental to human beings, that kind of stuff. So all of that there, this hum is there. You'll hear more about that. Remember I told you about the, you know, that staging area. Well, here's that same sketching thing by a totally different viewer, but it's showing those egg-like objects, these orb craft. It's a base, thin skinned, like shell waiting to be dispersed. Color changes from light to dark as they leave the staging area for flight. Interesting, right? Yeah, very. Yeah. Another viewer sketches, if you think of this as the sky trail, the egg-looking craft moving in sequence along some kind of pathway, unseen to the naked eye with life forms inside. So, you know, an interpretation of this sketch by a viewer is this is a, a one-way sky road. So it appears that they're depicting everything with life forms in them moving in a single direction. And maybe there's a different sky road that comes back, or maybe there are times where everything goes that way. And then, you know, everything comes back the other way and some other thing. It was just an interesting kind of an oddity that I've never seen viewers describe it in that kind of detail before. I just never have. Here are other viewers, uh, their sketches again, You've got tic this metallic, mm. yeah, tic tac spinning, and then you've got these energy fields around, it, like a dome of energy around it, and also there's kind of a depiction of energetics around this, like this. 
Here, again, different viewer comes pulsating energy radiation, emitting a frequency. Here's a tic-tac, again, metallic, different one than the other one. Charged ionized, grayish, dull, metallic spinning and tumbling. This is a depiction of a vortex, you know, or maybe it's the dome that's being described here and here. I'm not sure. Less gravity around it, a grid of light that is constantly changing, flickering, and pulsating. Different viewers, different stuff. Now, this viewer obviously has a beautiful hand for sketching, uh, but it's the mm -hmm. same kind of depiction, right? Here you see the tic-tac, but there are other tic-tacs around it, or maybe that's just the energy field. But look, here is that dome, that energetic barrier or dome, this metallic oblong object that appeared from the front as a ball-shaped circular with circular shadow or sphere of energy. Interesting descriptor. Maybe it's a tic tac that's just rotating in all those directions, right? Yeah. And then it, yeah, who knows? It, it could be, it also could be the depiction. See, again, the viewer is interpreting their perceptions. They don't know. They've never been in a tic tac, and, you know, at least not that they know. And uh, they also aren't told what they're looking at, right? They're not told you're supposed to be looking at tic tacs. So they're just drawing what they perceive. And it could be, one picture, you know, the top piece of the picture, it could be the shimmer of the energy. And the bottom picture could be like above look the, where that dome, the energy dome is looking down at it. You know what I mean? It, it's hard to say. You'd have to do more sessions with viewers on, you know, and focus in on something like this. And then it would start to unravel, you know, then it would get deeper and deeper and more meaning and get more people focused. But right now, you have 70 people looking at an event arc of time of six hours, right? So you get lots of different depictions. If you look up at the top, there's a one in closed in a square. I told you that there were two A7 Corsairs that crashed into the ground. They did not crash into the ground during the event arc of time which is why I didn't want to make too big a deal out of it, but I wanted to include it because I found out later, I was told that, oh yeah, two A7 Corsairs, like they got swatted out of the sky, just came in and both of them together just went straight down, crashed into the trees behind the ranch. And mm -hmm. this happened like 78, not 76. And then of course, once that happened, then it was a huge military turnout all over the place around there. And people were really concerned about it. You know, it wasn't a place that really liked authority anyway. There's a reason why they lived out there. And it was, it said that in that area at that time, it was, you know, well, look, it was the sixties and the seventies. So it was kind of hippie ish, you know, there was probably uh, a lot of things going on out there that they didn't want the police or they didn't want the military around. But, you know, that is a depiction of it. Here's another viewer draws this one, just says a streak of light, a craft falling from the sky, an explosion or energy presence, right? And they don't know. They didn't draw it as a winged aircraft. This one draws it as a winged aircraft, which oddly looks like an A7 Corsair. If you've ever seen one. This is just showing military trucks in convoy and uh, a guy standing uh, in the grass looking towards the trees in a military truck convoy. They didn't call it a military truck convoy. They said a truck convoy, military, question mark. So they were probably thinking that they might get away with avoiding an analytical overlay. <laughs> but I am also told that there were witnesses to this, which is a saucer-like craft that became disabled on the ranch back in the trees and landed there. And another craft came over to it, extended a docking mechanism of some sort, attached itself to the disabled craft, picked it up, and then they both flew away. And that the craft that went down, it was disabled, as you see up here, that there were four life forms and they had severe injuries. And there, this is the viewer's depiction of these four life forms pretty simplistic, but I mean, they're just saying there were life forms in here and they were injured when the craft went down. And they also got some dimensionality to it, or measurement. So that was interesting. This is again, you know, like this depiction of a center of some sort of vortice or vortex, something like that, right? Some kind of an explosion, some kind of a malfunction, you know, People looking at it, running, looking down at it, all those kinds of things. So it's a very interesting concept, which is why I wanted to put it in there. 
This is a viewer, again, who's very, very skilled. And I just want to point this out. The number 14 there is just the viewers will go back to, as they're doing your session summaries. The sketches that they have that were impactful to them, they will number them. So what they'll do is then they go into their session summary. And as they're writing their session summary, if this is a stage three or a stage six, it's a stage three and a half. It says it right here. So this is stage three. Stage three and a half is where you have this overwhelming desire to express what it is you are perceiving. It's a, it's a combination of things. There is a get out of jail card, meaning you don't have to go declare it as an AOL. You can do a stage three and a half and you can write down this concept. My concept is this, right? The words that come to mind, accident, blast, explosion, gas, explosion, a malfunction, of something there. And then, you know, Adam, something sounds, people running, looking down, confusion. That's a stage three and a half. It's a objectifying a concept that's just kind of overwhelming. It's and you think complex. the one on the and you think the one on the left is potentially the Corsair crash. It could be the Corsair crash or it could be the saucer, you know, that craft crash that had four life forms injured in it. Could be that. Hmm. Could be both. Again, further analysis would just have to be done uh, on it. More viewers looking at this. These incidents could be different or they could all be the same. Or they could, you know, one could be a course air crash. The other one might be an alien crash. The supposition is that all of those have happened in this place because it's such a busy place of high strangeness. So many craft sightings and different varying kinds of life forms being sighted that it's got to be a, one of those convergence points that the indigenous talk about in this particular area. So I don't mm -hmm. know. In order to get more down and dirty with that, I would have to pick a target and make it in that right there into its own separate target and send viewers in to look at that. We didn't have time to do that here, obviously. The sketch to the right starts to look bizarre, but this is a concept sketch that depicts a vortex, but life in this vortex, it's forming. Look at this. There's like a child. It's a, right? Like a spinning mm -hmm. sphere, but it looks, it looks like a child or light, but it could just be the sphere, but it's spinning in this. And then there's a depiction of it coming up and out and it forms into something. I mean, you just look at these things here, right? It's curved, but it begins to form into something. It, it's something that you're going to see a little bit later on. Here are more depictions of vortices, portals, openings, and that kind of stuff. This is different viewers describe them in different ways, right? Like psychedelic, you know, orange lines. I, I love that. The fact that they use that word for the 70s, you know, psychedelic. Mm -hmm. So orange lights stretched in a, a circle, right? And then here's a depiction of a vortice. Here's a depiction of a, you know, a spiral representing a vortice. This one's described as a circular metal cover or over a hole, I guess. Here's another one. This could be windmill or it is also how people, you know, look at and describe vortices because they're like spinning, spinning and spinning. Here again, this looks like the cistern, but you're, it's also is a depiction of a vortice. The way I can tell what they are or not is either by how they all correlate or have similarities, or if these are probed and labeled, and I'm certain that they are, these are all probe marks here. And I'm sure that just in the cropping of these individual pictures here, since we were running mm -hmm. out of time so much that the staff member that was working with me put that in there, left off you know, what was being described by the viewer. Here is, you know, another depiction of a vortice. This happens to be the same viewer that did this one here. So it's just, they're describing this though. And this is another thing that you get from viewers. They're seeing this as like a uh, film and it's because they're looking backward in time. So this is again, how the detect and the decode process and objectification takes place. There are all these snapshots of events that they're seeing take place in this event arc of time 
is being interpreted as like a piece of film with individual frames on it kind of thing. Is that meaningful? Yeah, it's meaningful if you know what you're looking at. They're not describing an old film roll. They have it here, old Kodak film roll, but that's not what they're, they're using that to symbolically explain what they're actually seeing, okay? Because they don't have a reference for it. So because they don't have a reference for it, their biological, your brain, your conscious mind goes, ah, you know, here's a close depiction of something, which is again, why you know, we put that kind of stuff down there. Is it over analysis uh, for me to be doing that? Is it kind of, uh, you know, my own analytical bias of it? No, I'm, I'm holding it up. I mean, it could be seen that way, but I'm holding it up as showing it as it's not right or wrong. It's just an interesting depiction of how viewers present things, how they see and, you know, how they struggle in the detecting and decoding process. It's not wrong, not wrong at all, but it's very interesting. Over in this one, now you've got, again, another description of things going bam and popped and, you know, moving and, you know, things crashing and, you know, energetic force, things moving, forceful, descriptive things that are moving through the air, swinging. It's just interesting stuff. These are really strange to see these. These are all depictions of mm -hmm. vortices, right? But what I thought was so interesting about particularly these two is that they look like, it looks like the, the sensed points, remember? That we were showing uh, these cones, these clusters yeah. of sense points, and it's showing it as above a ground level, right above the ground level. And this one describes it as metallic, -ing. metallic look like you know, like mica, but they're just depictions of vortices or craft or something else. And same thing here, same thing here, different viewers, but interesting depictions. Here again, you know, I'm just trying to show energetics that viewers are showing, mm -hmm. you know, energy moving, something solid that's moving. So it's some sort of vehicle moving here, moving it alive like fire or maybe not. And you know, maybe it's just an energy, nonlinear flying, traveling, like traveling into the future is this right here. All of these, these are depictions here. These are not trees. It's an energetic cloud or plasmas or something similar to that. This is viewers describing energetics. The descriptors work. Energetics, again, radiating, pulsating, energy outward, okay? Frequency, two pulses in rapid succession. We just ran out of time to actually transpose all this stuff and put actual text around it. Clusters mm -hmm. of energy close together, you know, et cetera, et cetera but the, they are swirling energy grouped together, swirl like a tornado wind moving clockwise outward then inward, continues repeating pattern clockwise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Drawing of this stuff like this, like the energetic, the something radiating out, pulsing a frequency, frequency pulsing, this is a depiction probably of this, you know? It's yeah, hard. the hum. Yeah, it's the hum, the LF hum noses that are there. Now, again, you know, my scientific brain, analytical brain tells me with the fact that there's so much fracking going on around there, or much of the humming could be fracking, but it yeah, also might not fair. be, you know, yeah, it could be, but it might not be, but emanating from underground as well as from other sources, some proceed becoming from different points in the sky. Life forms. <laughs> okay. Let's. Let's end the episode on this. We're going to do a whole episode on life forms. So, okay, just real, really quick before we start this, what do you think all these energetics are? Do you think they're portals? Do you think they're associated with this sky highway? I think all of the above. I, I think that this, because this place is such a very busy place and it has so many different descriptors of life forms and craft that are present there. And also just because of the other everyday activity of industry that's there, the vacant, you know, the empty aquifers under the ground, which must be massive cavernous things, the fracking, and all of that's just man-made scatter that's there. But there's also just all this unexplained high strangeness that's there. So I think that 
given my experience with portals and seeing them like in Chaco and other things. And I've for a long time thought from just an engineering perspective and from a physics perspective that these portals open and close, maybe they open and close like with some sort of garage door opener, like, you know, that a craft might have, or maybe they open and close based on some stimulus provided by a frequency. Maybe they open and close at regular or irregular intervals. Maybe they, you know, because they connect in interdimensionality. And that's a common thought, like, you know, the quantum foam of space time, that some of these things loop out of one dimension and connect to another dimension. Sometimes they loop back on each other, right? And from one dimension, loop out and come back in. But when they loop out, there could be another one of these portals that connects from another dimension to that one. So, I mean, it, when you see these artist depictions of quantum foam of space time, it's fascinating to think about it. And, and when you start talking about, you know, the other world's interpretations and you start to talk about multiverses and interdimensionality and all this other thing, it means that there have to be pathways back and forth through these things. Mm -hmm. You cannot travel across the universe, can't even travel across the galaxy. Even if you traveled at light speed, you know, it would be hundreds of years to get across, the, you know, just the galaxy, as I recall. So the idea of doing that, you couldn't do it. Those that are interstellar travelers or interdimensional travelers, they would have to have you know, sort of a roadmap to get to these things. And I think viewers, they don't know what they're looking at, but they understand that they're looking at some sort of pulsating energy that's there. So they're either describing craft moving or life forms, or, or they're describing vortices and portals. And, you know, it's not like they get a class on. Right. You know, how to what, define what or describe them. Define. Right. Yeah, exactly. And right. you don't give them a class on that. Like if you perceive a vortice, it will look, you know, it'll feel like this. No, I'd never do that because that would just scramble the effort. Yeah, I much prefer to see just the raw, you know, effort of trying to come to grips with what it is you think you're seeing and, you know, to detect it and to decode it and objectify it. And that's pure viewing, you know, at its finest. That's what makes it so cool, you know, and so effective, you know, because in the aftermath of this, like when you now know what it's supposed to be, it's easy to look at some of this and go like, well, maybe that doesn't fit. But that's not my job to do that. My job was to harvest what I could harvest in the amount of time that I had to harvest it, and then to make sense of it after the fact, you know, once I was told what it all was, and make sense of it for the viewers. Because I never want remote viewers to think that because what they sketched or how they sketched it, like the person sketching the film role. I get what that is. I understand. I've seen it so many thousands upon thousands and thousands of times from viewers, you know, over the decades that it's a struggle when you have no reference for something. It's a struggle to try to figure out how to depict it. I know that there's a, a thing that's referred to as the cosmic web now in, uh, mm -hmm. right. And that is in cosmology, physics and cosmology astrophysics, et cetera. And my God, that, that was a target that was in the unit, the remote viewing unit, before the term cosmic web was ever even, you know, invented. And now to see that and to see viewers draw that and sketch it and to see the viewers interpretation of that, it didn't happen in this target, but that I've given that as a target over the decades to advanced, really advanced classes. And I have seen people across classes and hundreds of viewers, if not thousands of them, describing, you know, standing in this cosmic web, standing in the flow of it, and describing it as like a capillary system for the universe that is moving and balancing energy in the universe. And of course, Viewers that are not physicists will describe that in you know simplistic terms like, oh, you know, it, it, it keeps negative and positive energy balanced in the universe. That's a simplistic way of looking at it. There has to be a balance of it. And there is negative as well as positive. So both exist. And if that kind of negative and positive energy is out of balance in one place, 
this cosmic web is one of the balancing apparatus. So I have seen viewers then describe standing in the flow of that, describe it as like screens coming at them, like moving mm. pictures, like coming at them, right? Moving around and depictions of life, life forms, events, history, whatever, you know, and who knows what it is. I mean, we, they still can't even figure out, you know, what dark energy is. They just are fairly certain it's there, but they don't know why. And that's what I meant by this becomes this kind of an enigma penetration task force, if you will, because here's viewers depicting this kind of stuff in that way. And they're depicting it as a meaningful flow of like living energy that means something from across the universe being moved around and put to establish a status quo of balance, right? I love that stuff about viewers and what they're capable of doing, which you saw that in there and it, not a roll of film it, that she's depicting. She's depicting a timeline of events that took place in that event arc of time. That's what she's depicting. She didn't capture all of them as individuals. Well, she did throughout the rest of her session, but that becomes like a first sketch of it, right? A first decoding of it. And it becomes this, you know, snapshot, 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 snapshot through the event arc of time. Plus, she's looking at like 20 some odd people, <laughs> you know, 20 some odd people in that right. six hour period, all experiencing similar but dissimilar aspects of what went on there. And that's how the viewer works. I mean, that's how they're trying to capture that. And yet other viewers will go right straight in and capture one of the snapshots of stuff and just unfold that all. It's a give and a take, right? I mean, some of it is you want them to see the total picture. You want to see the entire event arc of time. But like in that event arc of time for the Titanic, some people will go right straight in and engage on one of those moments in there. And they can't pull themselves off that tar baby. They just are right there. And that's not wrong. It's just every viewer is different, you know, and, and target the target session to session, you know, viewer to viewer day to day, it's always different. And it oftentimes it just has to do with what you have proclivities for or what you have interests in or what you have in your experience database, right? What you have references for. The idea is to get every viewer every day to try to disengage from those things and, you know, see the bigger picture, but it, it doesn't always work that way. Well, I think this is a uh fascinating place. I agree. Now, with that, thank you very much, David. And I look forward to talking to you about life forms at this target in the next episode in this series. All right, my friend. If you enjoyed this video, please click on like, subscribe, and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime I post something new.